Hello, and welcome to What Now, a video interview series brought to you by Michigan Future, a nonpartisan think tank striving to be a catalyst for recreating a high prosperity Michigan. I'm Sarah Sherpicki, the Vice President of Michigan Future and your host. We've launched this video series in response to the global coronavirus pandemic. It reflects our observation that the pandemic has been highlighting issues that were critical before the pandemic began, but that have been exacerbated by the crisis. The truth is, even before the pandemic, there was a lot that wasn't working for far too many Michigan families. For instance, today, the best indicator of whether a young person will earn a college degree is whether their parents did. This is a dangerous place for us to be as a state and a nation and risks for closing on the American dream for too many people. This is why in the first series of What Now, we're focused on education. We're discussing ideas that can help us navigate the pandemic, but they can also inform us as we redesign systems in our recovery. And so we're delighted to have David as our guest today. David Britton is a retired U.S. Army officer with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel of Infantry. Upon his retirement from the military, he was appointed principal of Wayland, Stevie, and Pine Street Elementary Schools. In 2002, he left Wayland and took on the role of principal at Lee Middle and High School in the community where he grew up in the 1960s. He later was appointed superintendent of Godfrey Lee Public Schools. He retired in 2017 following nine years in that position after initiating a really critical shift in that district towards an education that builds success skills in kids. David, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so you have an interesting background where you both have served in the military and then been in education. Um, what like made you get into education when you left your service? Well, um, actually, uh, I got into education a little bit while I was in the service. Mm -hmm. um, I started out as a reservist, and uh, that was while I was going to <clears throat> Grand Valley State University, and uh, and I met my wife there. Taught school at Muskegon Catholic Central uh, mm -hmm. for a couple of years in the early 80s, and then they asked me to come on active duty. Um, it was supposed to only be a couple of years, but I ended up doing a full career and, mm -hmm. and then retiring. And well, my last year that I knew I was going to be retiring that fall, uh, the superintendent in Wayland uh, wanted to meet me for lunch because he'd heard about me retiring and wanted to uh, talk to me about a principalship. So <laughs> that's how I transitioned over. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So uh, having sort of these like uh, two careers, basically, yeah. I'm wondering about like, as you, as you have thought over the years about like what kids need and mm -hmm. what, what's the point of education? What's the point yeah. of our education system? What are some of the biggest, I don't know, like philosophical or, um, yeah, sure. you know, changes in your approach and your thinking over your careers? Well, <laughs> One of the things I really thought kids needed, and I thought this while I was still in the service with some of my young soldiers, is the uh, ability to solve problems, especially individual problems and concerns and things like that. Um, it, it wasn't uncommon that you'd have a soldier whose car would break down and then just wouldn't show up for duty. And then that was his excuse, the car broke down. And made no other kind of effort, nor bothered to telephone or anything. <laughs> uh, and, and, it, and when you started to suggest some things, they'd look at you like, really? Hmm. Really? <laughs> and uh, so uh, I kind of felt like, you know, things were changing in society with young kids. Not mm -hmm. we. I had a lot of independence as a young child growing up, like, I was one of those free range kids mm -hmm. had seven children in the family and mom, dad couldn't keep track of where anybody was. <laughs> and, uh, and that was okay. Uh, well, most of the time it was okay, <laughs> but, uh, we had to learn to solve problems. And mm -hmm. if they said, you want to eat, you'd be home at this time. You knew you had to figure out how to make sure you were home at that, mm -hmm. that time. I don't think, uh, at least, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and maybe it's even worse now in some ways. Um, kids kids learn how to do that. We get, they get opportunities to do that. So 
I thought if I could be part of the educational process, even as an administrator, that when a student got into trouble, I was probably going to see that student. Mm -hmm. And can we work through this? Can and, and then forget about it and move on. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Like that it was important to you to make sure the kid understood they had a chance to start over, that it yeah. wasn't gonna like, right. making one mistake wasn't gonna. Right. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I was always honest with them, told them I was expelled from school in sixth grade. So if I've done it, whatever you've done, I've done. <laughs> so let's, let's work this out. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, are are there others that you want to share, like particular sort of moments where you've thought I you learned something new as yes. a, even after you'd been in education for a while? Yes, while I was still in Wayland, um, and it was a fifth and sixth grade school. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where I came up with the idea. I may have seen it being done at another school, but with older kids, I thought we, you know, it'd be kind of fun to have a a weekly news team. We had a, a new in-house uh, video system um, that would go into all the classrooms. Uh, they had just installed it, but nobody knew what to use it for, <laughs> anything like that. So we, we gathered up some old equipment. It was very old and I developed some teams and, uh, uh, and, and a process for doing this, which changed a lot over the six years I was there. But uh, in doing it, I started to realize, you know what, you give these kids something they like to do in a project to complete, and you tell them it's got to go on the air Friday morning mm -hmm. when school starts. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to watch what they're capable of doing mm -hmm. um, and what they're willing to do. They give up their lunch periods to come in and work on it mm -hmm. uh, and to get it and to get it ready. And uh, and I had to do very little. Um, coaching or coddling. I mean, I helped some of the kids out with the equipment, learn how to use it, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, Watch them decide on their own to do green screening and to find out what happens when your colored braces are the same color as the green screen. You know, we had a lot of laughs and stuff, but then mm -hmm. they go, well, maybe we should use a different color. So you could see Mm -hmm. on their own uh, and I thought boy you know what this is what education really should be like mm -hmm. for kids so I kind of carried that on with me when I left Wayland and went to Godfrey Lee but uh, uh, and, and I'm looking for even a, a broader approach than just eight or ten kids benefiting from a program so mm -hmm. well and so it sounds like what what emerged to you as like the really critical components of that were there was that authentic audience, right? There mm -hmm. was like, they were doing something other people were going to see. Mm -hmm. They had an interest yep. um, and you gave them freedom to uh, maybe sometimes they would experiment and things wouldn't work out, I assume. Mm -hmm. So there was some right. sort of safe risk taking that was allowed. Yeah. Um, well, so tell us a little bit about Godfrey Lee, which is that district where you ended mm -hmm. your career as a superintendent. Um, mm -hmm and the kids that you work with? It's been an immigrant community for much of its years, but it switched from a Dutch to more of a you know, Latin America, Central America, and even Africa, African mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's, there's been, a, been a significant change. And a lot of those parents and things did not have good experiences with schools that they came from. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so they, they liked the community. They liked the smallness of the district. Um, they liked the fact that they could get to know pretty much all of the teachers mm -hmm. and, uh, and be close to their kids, not hour long bus rides and things like that. So it's, uh, uh, so now it's uh, one of the most impoverished districts in the uh, state. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, at one time, at least while I was there, had the second highest percentage of ELL, English language learners mm -hmm. in the school. So lots of challenges as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it's just, it's just uh, for people who spend just a little bit of time there for the first time are kind of amazed mm -hmm. at what the district really is like. Mm -hmm. Well, what is it like? I mean, say more, like what's the, what's the feel like? <laughs> well, it feel, it feels like family. The kids are very friendly, uh, courteous, um, almost, 
too polite sometimes, you know. It's, mm-hmm. it's kind of like, wait a minute, you've said good morning to me 27 times already. <laughs> you don't have to keep doing that. Yeah. <laughs> they, but they, they are that way, very polite. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, and I think they, they care a lot about their families mm-hmm. and, their, and their own futures as well. Mm-hmm. Well, so let's let's talk a little bit about the six C's um, since you were who introduced us at Michigan Future to that framework. Um, so they are communication, collaboration, content, mm-hmm. critical thinking, creative innovation, and confidence. So what when you sort of read about that framework, what made yeah. you think like this, I we need this? Well, we we had been looking or you know, I had uh, kind of kicked off uh, an effort probably about uh, 2014 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we came to the realization that uh, the tr- traditional school model and the way we measure student learning mm-hmm. is not going to work for our kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and that better sameness wasn't going to make that much of a difference (laughs) that what we really needed to do was to make some substantial changes to the educational model so we just we started out with the human-centered design process first Mm -hmm. and uh, with the help of steelcase foundation Mm -hmm. we were able to put a team together because i I tried to convince i'm not sure they were totally convinced but i tried to convince everyone that I don't know what we should do or what it should look like when we get there. Mm-hmm. And they just keep looking at me like saying, oh, come on, tell us what you really want. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I don't know. what I don't know what schools should. I know what learning is, is about. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how you package that into a school system. I just know that the way we're doing it now was great up through World War II, but after World War II, things changed, and it's really not a good system anymore, good yeah. model. And so we, we got that process started of trying to really understand where we're at and where we probably should go as a district when we just started to say, wait a minute, we don't even know what a learner is. Hmm. We're sitting here trying to develop a new learning model we haven't even decided what is a learner hmm. in our, and what should that look like in our school system learning, mm-hmm. not just the kids, but yeah. the adults as well. Mm-hmm. And that's where we first started with the four C's looking at that model. We went to a conference on it out in Denver and um, just kept feeling like something was missing from mm-hmm. it. I mean, it talked about these skills of collaboration and communication and creative thinking and things like that, critical thinking. But it didn't, uh, it just seemed like, well, wait a minute, education can't be totally about that. You can't just throw content out the window mm-hmm. and say, we're just going to do these things. Because mm-hmm. you can do those things without ever having a textbook or a curriculum. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, actually, Carol, was uh, Lautenbach, Dr. Lautenbach came on to the uh, uh, 6C model and brought it to me and said, what if we took some of the grant money and pulled a team together and studied this model Hmm. and see if we could come up with a framework for Godfrey Lee based on this Hmm. model. So I I said, go at it. Um, And uh, we started to look at it and we said, well, you know, content is included in this and content is important, but we don't want everyone to just go to the center of that chart and say, oh yeah, there's content. Okay. I'll mm-hmm. teach content. Mm-hmm. We, we, we want them to see that content is just part of the framework. And so we started using the term. It's, it's kind of the roadway on which we're going to build these other skills. Yes, yeah. We got to have it we got to have some content to work with. Otherwise they can't, what are they going to create? What are they going to collaborate on? Exactly, right. And those kinds of things. So, but what really caught my eye was the confidence. Mm-hmm. Um, I go to a lot of events with kids, um, groups of kids and things like that. 
And a lot of times they involved other schools, some of them very affluent schools in the area. And the kids were, would get up and do the talking and things like that. And it didn't take long for me to notice our kids didn't have, and they would sink into the background and their communication skills were a little weak, but you could see that they weren't real confident to get up and talk, whereas mm -hmm. other kids from other schools were, who might've had more experiences at that and stuff. And I said, so if, if we can build confidence in our kids, even some of these other areas that might be a little bit weak, particularly the content area, maybe that will help strengthen those if they feel better about themselves and what they're doing. One of the ways I've thought about confidence is that um, in order to learn, you do have to be able to take intellectual risks or creative risks or say something that mm -hmm. maybe is wrong. Right. And that without confidence, um, it's harder to move forward in those, in those other areas. And especially when you get into middle school and, and high school, kids are afraid to be wrong. Yeah, yeah. Because they've grown up in a system that evaluates everything on right and wrong. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're never almost right. <laughs> you know, at least not in their eyes. If, if I don't, if I didn't get an A or a B, I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and and so it's it's pretty much ingrained. Yeah, seeing that, that daring to fail, of course, that's the very high end of confidence Yeah, when, when you dare to fail. And that's, that's hopefully um, where they're headed. Mm -hmm. So um, if you think about sort of centering, being able to articulate the skills that you want kids to have. I mean, I'm, I think there are a lot of schools that don't even necessarily have an articulation of where it is we're trying to go. So you have that articulation, then what are the type of, uh, like, why doesn't a traditional school model necessarily build those skills? Like, what are the learning experiences that, that kids need in order to really grow in those areas? Well, the traditional school system model we're on now, which uh, came about in the late 1800s, was basically designed to create a lot of very similar workers for the industrial age. And, uh, and of course, every now and then a small percentage of them would squeeze up into the professional classes. But for the most part, it was designed for to produce uh, consistent consistency in graduation. So all of the structure of schooling after we left the one room schoolhouse, switched over to this highly efficient economical structure that mirrored in some respects, the occupations of what we we're trying to get these kids to. So they can learn to follow directions. They can learn to come to school and be on time. And, mm -hmm. and if they're given a task to do, they get it done and turn it in. And, uh, and, and of course, then um, enough basic civics, writing, math, uh, and um, some communication skills for them to be good citizens within the community. But now we're in a technology age, an information age. And a lot of those jobs and everything that we educated kids for in the early 20th 20th century are gone. The schools have pretty much stayed the same. We always used to say, aside from whiteboards versus chalkboards, <laughs> if one of our retirees from 1960 came back and walked into a classroom, within about a half an hour, they'd feel pretty comfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not a whole lot has changed. That was before, of course, the, the big push for laptops and technology in the classrooms, but mm -hmm. it, it's still those things too, have not really panned out to what we've wanted them to be. They've become more of just a, an assistive tool, similar to if they brought pencils, pens, and everything else. We want school to be what it was like mm -hmm. when we went to school. Yeah. We, we've got to have a, a school district that is more adapted to individualized student learning what do these students what does what do i need as a student and what do i want to do what do i like mm -hmm. how do you think the experience maybe from a teacher perspective changes if they're really 
if they're in a school where they're told it's your job to teach the six, to foster the six C's. It's really the, the entire district with support from the parents mm -hmm. role to provide learning experiences mm -hmm. that create that. Um, you, you saw the, the film most likely to succeed, which I highly continue to highly recommend. They created an environment for students to maximize their learning. Mm -hmm. the, the teachers become facilitators of that environment. Mm -hmm. to, they they, they um, provide some learning experiences in terms of, of here's what we're going to want you to do. I, re I recall from that movie, them explain, trying to explain to the kids what you're going to do at the end of your freshman year. And they couldn't fully even explain what it was going to be like mm -hmm. at the end of the year, but they had an idea and they were going to continue to throw that out and um, guide those kids along that path. But the learning part of it, was totally in the students' hands with teachers coming back and forth to them to teach them different pieces of content that could be used uh, in their projects that they were going to demonstrate at the end of the year. And that demonstration guided them. There are, there are lots of teachers out there that want to mm -hmm. take this on mm -hmm. and uh, are frustrated by all the roadblocks that are put up in front of them. Yeah. by their home districts and yeah. principals. So and things. What, what are those barriers, either at the district level or, I mean, at the state level? Like, what are the constraints that are preventing? preventing well, you got to start with testing because the, and I'm not, I, I'm not anti-testing um, at all. People think I am, but I'm because of some of the things I've spouted off about, but I'm not. I'm, I'm, we've just made, testing the premier indicator of whether or not schools are doing their job. Mm -hmm. They have little to do with whether kids are learning. And that fact has been stated over and over and over by professionals involved in the testing arena. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically just a way to uh, point fingers at who's doing well out there and who's not doing well out there. The, that Those kinds of things then cause us to narrow the curriculum down and the uh, instruction put on teachers. Teachers are not necessarily going to trust that the student is going to learn something he's supposed to know mm -hmm. just because I give him a project. He may never learn that piece of content or that skill based on that project. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not going to trust that. They're going to want to teach that hammer that home over and over. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, it's a real impediment. Then we throw in the college entrance exams, which are now kind of muddled because of COVID, but still we throw those in there. Uh, and those are um, definitely just sorting and selecting test design. Now you've got teachers buying materials for SAT prep and everything else and, and teaching that. In the meantime, on no test, are they gonna give you a score on collaboration? Yeah. Or, commu or communication or critical thinking. Well, critical thinking can be embedded somewhat in it, yeah. but it also could be the result of a very good guess on the part of the student. And right. you don't really know if that student critically thought their way through that or right. not. Right. Uh, and uh, creative innovation. Whereas if they're in a room full of people and they're demonstrating something they've created or, or are doing, pretty hard to guess on things mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, know, you either did uh, or didn't and then if I start to ask you questions about that project to see what your thought processes were right we find out how far did you get in this matrix mm -hmm. so I, it, you, you just can't I mean funds too I, funding's always a hurdle for any public agency uh, to try to, to do new things unlike private uh, corporations who can reserve funds for research and development. Schools have very little of that yeah. Uh, yeah. to do uh, and, and, uh, and the time to do it in because they got to change the plane's structure 
while they're flying the plane. So, I mean, I know you're not in the district right now, but sort of as you observe um, the pandemic, I mean, I know you're still mm -hmm. um, sort of close with people. Um, I mean, what, what are your fears, not just in Godfrey Lee, but like in Michigan or in the U.S. about sort of what's going on with kids right now? Um, well, I'm, I'm mostly concerned about uh, what kids are hearing and seeing with regards to science and medical science in particular. Mm -hmm. That. You know, their brain, brains are still developing, particularly at that middle level, which is, and, and for them to constantly hear that um, uh, we can't trust our medical establishments and our scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's, it's made science a political process mm -hmm. versus the scientific process. And it's always been an area that we struggled with anyway at Godfrey Lee was science. Mm. Part of it because the vocabulary is confusing because we use the same words we use every day differently in science in some cases. And so some of our English language learners struggle with that. <laughs> but, but primarily because it's hard to make it interesting in a one hour time period yeah. um, and, and, and let it be student driven. Yeah. And there's some risks to that when particularly in chemistry and stuff like that. But uh, I know that I had a number of conversations with some of my science teachers uh, over the years about it, it doesn't help when you give them a script that says step one, do this, step two, do this. If you you know, uh, if you were thinking about how to deliver six C's style or oriented learning in remote environments mm -hmm. right now with all, so many kids, you know, in virtual school, yeah. um, like what would you be prioritizing or? You could do something very similar. Um, yeah, you, it, it's not going to be as noisy and crazy as what we saw and most likely to succeed in classrooms and things like that where everybody's working, groups are working here and there. Um, but um, for instance, if you have kids that are totally remote learners, you can still provide them with a, with a project idea. First, you'd want to find out, and, and my daughter-in-law is really good with this. She teaches totally remote learning for Lee High School. Mm -hmm. She's, she wants to know what the kids are thinking. She wants the kids to talk yeah, yeah. and not her just be delivering and seeing if they did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if, if you can find out from them, what would you be interested in studying? I thought last spring we missed the boat. Mm. <coughs> we had, an, even though it was, uh, whoa, we're not going to school anymore. Mm -hmm. it, what we tried to do and we're still trying to do is pack the same curriculum and the similar, similar teaching style from a distance mm -hmm. onto a computer. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the power of that type of a system. It's, uh, and I think that's why people were frustrated. And I think yeah. that's why kids stopped tuning in. Yeah. A lot of them did. Yeah. Yeah, this is the same boring stuff. Mm -hmm. If they had an opportunity to create something, make something and what, and then, Unlike my kids, when they had the TV program, they didn't have YouTube to publish their programs on to show other people. These mm -hmm. kids do, and mm -hmm. uh, and if they can can demonstrate that via video to the rest of the class, so how would you structure something for uh, you know maybe middle and high school kids? And we don't worry about it as much for elementary, but where they're well, still have, getting collaboration. Yeah, you have two types of collaboration. You have collaboration within a group of kids or between the student and the teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a form of collaboration, probably mm -hmm. the weakest form, mm -hmm. um, strongest form, probably be with the kids. But when, when, when I started bringing technology into the district, one of the, the collaboration and communication skills that I saw were kids reaching out to subject matter experts. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, there was there was a, a school I went to in uh, New Jersey, and uh, 
they had a uh, um, once a week or something, a group would, would uh, come on to the all school. I don't know if it was radio or TV. I can't remember now, but mm -hmm. they included an interview of somebody. So someone was, was doing the author thing and they interviewed a specific author mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. And so they were able to bring in what the author was saying with their own and present it to the students. Yeah. Um, I, I, and they said every week there's a different group that did different things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways to, to collaborate. Um, when it comes to the top of creating something together, depends on how you define together. So, I mean, if we are just to um, kind of think about right now as an opportunity, you know, and um, like, how do we, I don't even know, what, are, what do we try to emphasize so that when we come back, we have an opportunity to think about schooling differently um, and about this building the skills that kids really need, like. I think it's a great time right now to be collecting up what's working and not working with the way we're doing it. I think you're not going to change people until you can give them the hard evidence that what we're doing doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if this is a, a one-time event only mm -hmm. or if we're going to have to deal with this again in the future. But at the same time, it, it also gives us the opportunity to see since we can't always be in the classroom, but we want to be learning. Mm -hmm. How do we take that step together then and, and create a system that allows kids to learn and demonstrate that learning no matter where they're at? Yeah. I think one of the things that came up right away in the spring um, was uh, um, the kids were allowed to sign up for some kind of a physical event, whether it was just bike riding on the in the park or walking or whatnot, and and keep a journal mm -hmm. of it and turn it in for their physical education credit. Sure. Um, and then you could also say, but that's not just physical education. There's some science in there, right? So how could we, in, you know, incorporate some science credit into that particular thing without ruining, ruining the enjoyment of what the kids are doing? Because mm -hmm. we could cram all kinds of stuff in there, and now you're going to write this and write that and write this. No, oh, the kids, I don't want to go for a walk. I don't want to go ride my bike. You keep <laughs> all this stuff. But um, could they? Uh, could they come back and demonstrate something um, either with a video they created or what have you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think uh, we have to, uh, I, I know superintendents are just, I am so happy I retired <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from that job, not mm -hmm. from the school. I miss the kids and, and, and the people, but yeah. from that particular job, the, uh, uh, but somebody has to take the lead in a school district and, and try to use what we're learning from this experience to, to be able to question, well, then we don't need to always do it the way we always did it since yeah. we just spent a half year, a whole year, whatever it is, mm -hmm. doing it differently. Mm -hmm. That is, that is so interesting. I mean, like you could just think about deploying a bunch of, I don't know, qualitative evaluation folks mm -hmm. from U of M or, you know, one of the colleges yeah. to look at it as almost a research project, right? Like what, what worked here? Where did kids sort of end up somehow thriving and developing these skills despite yeah. everything that's hard right now? Um, yeah, yeah. And that that can become like the, basis for an argument about what we need mm -hmm. instead of what we've had. Mm -hmm. Even if it's just simple heading to the state forest or something like that, yeah. um, whatever they can do is just going to benefit those kids even more, maybe even more if they were sitting in a classroom and just learning, mm -hmm. to, or learning it long enough to regurgitate it on a test. Mm -hmm. 
Um, are there any uh, like resources or books or movies or anything that you would recommend to parents or well, to teachers, I guess? Yeah, of course, the, uh, the most movie likely. Most Likely to Succeed film. Okay. And it's available on Apple to rent or buy. Okay. Um, and then, of course, sadly, we lost Sir Ken Robinson here not too long ago. But uh, his, his uh, two TED Talks, Do Schools Kill Creativity, which is a, an older one. I think it's 12, maybe 12 years old mm -hmm. and uh, just outstanding. And then he had a follow up one not too long ago, How to Escape Education's Dev Valley. Yeah. Those, those are just some great videos that will at least get parents thinking, well, why do we, why does our school or why can't our school do something like this? Yeah. Maybe they, they get an opportunity to express that. Yeah. Uh, and then there's Timeless Learning, which is a book. Um, I have some friends in Virginia and uh, a retired superintendent there at Albemarle County Schools. Uh, and um, they wrote that book. And every, I've been to their schools. They have quite a few schools compared to 17,000 students. And uh, the, but every, and that's, it's great for teachers as well as parents, but teachers in particular, because it's basically saying every classroom doesn't have to do it the same way. Mm -hmm. Every school doesn't have to do it the same way. Mm -hmm. Bring people along when they're ready, but show them how it's being done and being successful so that they feel more competent. Yeah confident in doing it themselves take them through those six c's yeah build that confidence level yeah to the point where they're not now they're willing to try it in their classroom yeah. so i just think that's a fantastic book okay uh, by pam moran and and, and her uh, compatriots yeah. thank you so much for giving us your time and thoughts and i hope you continue to stay well you too weird time yeah yeah all, all right bye. take care yep if David piqued your interest, you can find some of the other resources he mentioned here. In our next episode, we're talking with Danielle Jackson, the CEO of Detroit 9090 U Prep Schools. Please join us. If we are expecting the little humans to do this deep work of self-actualization, then the big humans have to do it too. We'd love to hear from you about how to make Michigan's education system work better for all kids. Please find us on social media.